Okay, so my, my anecdote to introduce our final storyteller, Barefoot Ted, goes like this. Um, this here is Bookus. Um, Bookus and his older brother, Scott, um, and a couple other kids from Salt Lake all went to a zine symposium in Portland in 2003. And um, I was uh, living with a guy who made a zine about sort of traveling and stuff. Um, at the time, and I was doing, I was trying to make like a website version of a zine distro where you download PDFs instead of mail ordering, you know, pieces of paper like idiots. So um, we went to the zine symposium and it was just full of what people would now call hipsters. We didn't quite call each other that then, but people who collect like antique typewriters, right? And like hand stitch the like uh, binding in their threads or in their uh, zines. It was, it was not the zine set that I had grown up with of like, this sort of like punk rock photocopy, you know, we make these zines as a way to communicate across like scenes and like time zones and state lines because we didn't have MySpace and Facebook and blogs and web really. I mean, we barely had like AOL or whatever. Um, so we made these zines out of a sort of like pragmatism. And then that pragmatism was sort of stripped away by the web, rightly so. So now the, the sort of zine culture is more um, for like the aesthetic of it or for like the kitsch is too strong but you know like the the sort of it's a craft yeah you know um more like the etsy set and less like the um like the mohawk set so we're at this thing i meet bookus and his brother scott and our friend gary because they were the only other like punk looking kids and i was like oh my gosh and they like some of them turned out to also be vegan straight edge or some combination and um they were the first people to say, oh my gosh, you live in place X. I've always wanted to go to place X, which in this case was Santa Cruz. And, um, and then Scott actually showed up like a month later. That had never happened to me before. Like I always travel to my friends. They don't really come to me. And like they showed up. I was like, awesome. And then I ended up kind of like falling in love with these like batch of kids that lived at this squat house in Salt Lake City. And then I later moved there. And then later we all move up to Seattle. I'm going a long way for this one. Um, and... Yes, but it doesn't end in a pun, unfortunately. Um, and, you know, like all things, sort of houses, you know, things fall apart. We go our separate ways. And one day, Scott, uh, Bookus and Scott are in Ravenna Park? Volunteer. Volunteer Park, slacklining between a couple trees. And this guy was there, too. And they get talking to each other because you all had read Born to Run? So they had read the book Born to Run. They were like, hey, are you Barefoot Ted? We just read the book. We like slacklining. Let's be friends. Turns out, you know, he's got some of the story to tell that I won't tell his side. And then, um, so, you know, this book was sort of introduced to me years ago. You should read this, which I think everyone should read. It's real great. Um, even if you don't fancy yourself a runner or don't want to become a runner, it's just this really, like, kind of fascinating story. And... Um, Years later, I end up at the Square office, like square.com, little swipey thing, and they had on their like stack of free books, everyone should take one of these, Born to Run. So I finally picked one up like two years ago. And then finally, just a few months ago at Burning Man, I took my stack of like, you know, bound printed matter, and I was like, this is going to be my Playa project. I'm going to read books. And uh, I read Born to Run like, like 36 hours. I like, couldn't put it down. And I woke up one morning, I was like, I'm going to go for a run at Burning Man. And... <laughs> Which is the hottest, um, windiest, dustiest run you'll ever do. Maybe not hottest, but it's up there. Um, but it's also the flattest, right? Like, I just ran in this big circle, and, like, like it's de deceiving how far you're actually running when you could see all the terrain. Um, and turns out there was a 50K happening, and I did not run a 50K, but I was on, like, my first lap, or what would have been my first lap if I did more than one, when everyone was on their last lap of this like seven mile loop. And they were like, you look good, buddy. I was like, thanks. And then like, <laughs> a after I saw, you know, like the first guy in like purple spandex pants and no shirt with like a number there, I thought, oh, that's his like Burning Man costume. He's like marathoner guy. <laughs> and, then, and then I see another one and I'm like, that's maybe a group, a camp. There's like the marathoners camp. And then I see a bunch and we pass this like thing that's clear like the start finish line I was like is there something happening they're like 50k and that's when people started giving me compliments I was like I'll take it so I ended up <laughs> I ended up running a little seven mile loop um which was the longest run I had done 
largely because I, you know, woke up pumped from this book, Born to Run, and that sort of brings us all, all back around. Barefoot Ted is one of the characters in that book, and that, that book sort of collects characters. And um, I actually started trying to get Ted at this since the first one, and our schedules just kept not aligning. And I'm so happy he could make it for the final talk at the final conf. Barefoot Ted. Thank you. Yeah, that story actually, there's, and it's connected to, I've got a bizarre, I had a lot of fun making, you know, he, Shane wanted collapse in the title. So I was like, collapse, whoa, what the hell am I going to say about that? And then I was like, oh, yeah, collapse, okay. So my title is kind of bizarre, and but I will enjoy trying to explain what it means. And the title of my talk is Gravitational Collapse, Energetic Wheels, Ape Locomotion, A History. And uh, <laughs> I know that's crazy. And... Um, Believe me, I take great pleasure in uh, telling you that I know that's crazy. But I want to uh, read a little bit more about, uh, about it, and then I'm going to fill in all the gaps. How's that sound? So then I say, I wanna, I, I'm going to take a quick look at strategies used by the genus Homo to enhance and extend the joy of mobility past and present. Starting with the evolution of bipedalism and the radical growth of the brain, I will catalog what I see as the most important behaviors, capacities, and inventions that propelled humans into the now, and I will demonstrate where I think we are going next. I had so much fun writing that. I was like, oh my God, what the hell are they going to think about that shit? <laughs> I'll get to it. I'll get to it. But I want to get back to several things. Um, Number one, the book Born to Run. I don't know. Has anybody read that book? Anybody here? So there's a few there. Important chapter for those of you who haven't read it. Go to chapter 25, verse 1. That's the way I like to say it. The sentence is the following. One of the finest sentences in American literature, I think. It goes like this. Barefoot Ted was right, of course. Okay, so y y that basically sums it up. Now... It turns out I grew up uh, spending a lot of time under avocado trees, and, and um, avocado trees have a really big part of my life, actually. So it's kind of cool to be sitting here. Above my kitchen is an avocado leaf from the tree that my, was growing in my grandmother's garden, which isn't very more than 20 miles away from here. And uh, she had one tree that fruited in uh, late summer and one tree that fruited in the fall. And I ate avocados all my life, all the time, and I had no idea that they were expensive or valuable. I just loved them, along with pomegranates and figs and, and all the other good stuff that you can grow. And believe me, I just spent six months in Turkey this year, and I found out where the holy land is for all this stuff. And let me tell you, well, avocados, not that, that's not one of them. You know, no, avocado nautal is uh, testicles. Anyway, how did I get there? I don't know. Back to the gravitational stuff. So Bookus and, and his brother are slacklining in the park. I come running around the corner with my two Siberian Huskies at speed, barefooted on wet grass, and come to a screeching halt. And this guy goes, we know who you are, or something like that. And I'm like, who am I? They're Barefoot Ted. And I'm like, oh, cool. And I was like, oh, I want to slackline you. And anyway, long story short, they taught me how to slackline. And I was like, oh, these guys are cool. And it turns out that... I had already met Bookus about a year before that. And it's kind of connected to my whole entire history of playing around with movement and mobility. I met Bookus riding my high wheel bicycle through Volunteer Park. I have one of those, you know, 1890 is the last year of them, you know, the antique bicycles. Those things are awesome. I really love them. And the reason I love them is because they're one of the few form vehicles, human powered vehicles, that allow you to keep moving like a human being. Human beings are upright creatures. You might have noticed that. You know, this is like a much more appropriate position to be standing than sort of like this, right? This is kind of weird. The only other animal that I know that moves while it's sitting is a dog with a scratchy butt. So, you know. <laughs> I don't know why, it's, it's like we've, we've sort of got ourselves used to sort of um, uh, contorting ourselves to fit the equipment because the efficiency comes from contorting ourselves to the equipment, i.e. the very basic what's called a safety bicycle as opposed to an ordinary bicycle. High wheel bicycles were known as ordinaries. Safety bicycles were known as safeties, and they weren't any good until the pneumatic tire was developed in 1889, and by 1890, the whole world changed. And a lot of great things happen. I mean, you can say some feminists will write that a lot of um, women started being able to wear pants and ride bicycles and they had freedom and all of that. But that pneumatic tire screwed up this history of 
machines that allowed you to be like this, up above your work. And when you're riding a high wheel bicycle, it feels as if you're just willing yourself through space. It's kind of similar to walking. And the problem is, as joyful and as wonderful and as awesome as it is to ride a high wheel bicycle, they're not very practical, they're not very safe, and less than 0.001% of the world's population is ever going to ride one. So there you have it. I met him, I was riding through this park, and nobody else was like really, like they were kind of like, Se Seattle people don't want to like pay attention to like, if something's new or the, they just kind of, it doesn't exist, or it's scary. <laughs> and he was like, hey, you know, they, he kind of, you know, we had a conversation. A year later, I'm stopping, there our relationship begins. I'm trying to start a sandal company because I had spent uh, a lot of times investigating another form of mobility, and that is running. I was having a great difficulty trying to crack the nut of running. I had decided before my 40th birthday I was going to try to run a marathon because a, a California senator's son, and, 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 and there was a guy named Alan Cranston. His son ran a marathon when he was 40 years old, and he had a party at the Santa Monica Pier Carousel that my family was operating at that time. And I thought, holy crap, a 40-year-old man can run a marathon? My God, I'm going to shoot for that when I get up in those age, you know, that, that high age age bracket. And that date was coming, and I started investigating running. And I found it to be a brutally hard and impossible thing to do. And I really thought that the only way it was possible is that you either had to take painkillers or be insane or really have to find some really cool technology. And I, I decided that the technology part was going to be the solution. So I started doing a lot of investigating, and I found some incredibly bitchin' shoes from Switzerland called Kango Jumps. I mean, they were awesome. Leaf springs uh, built into the boot, and you, I basically, they'd come out with a new one, and I was, I was uh, Googling and eyeballing those things, and I was going, oh my God, I'm going to be one of the first to get these things, and I'm going to tigger myself into history. So with regular running shoes, I was getting to about an hour. I could run for about an hour, and then it was just like, it, was, didn't, it wasn't that I didn't have any more juice. As you can see, I got some juice, but I was like in pain. And I was like going, what the hell am I going to do? So I had the solution. I, was, I bought these were expensive. I didn't really have very much money. I was waiting, waiting for them to come. They came. I figured instead of uh, one hour, I figure on the first day with these things, since they were, they were l really hyping them, they were like, I forget how many times more impact they were going to resist and you were going to be able to go this, that. And, and I was thinking two hours out of the box. Well, I put them on, and like 15 minutes later, I was basically feeling the same kind of pain that I was getting when I was, you know, uh, running for one hour in my better running suit. So I was like, whoa, crap. I turned the dial to 11, and here I am still nothing, not, no good. So I had to really reconsider what the hell I was going to do because I was really committed to trying to learn how to run. So I started investigating it, and it just so happens that there were people back in that time that were suggesting that the possibility is that human beings had evolved to become like, uh, like they were the, considered to be the preeminent endurance animal on the planet. And if you added sp heat, distance, and speed, you would, could, you would end up having humans ride to the top. We're not the fastest, we're like really incredibly slow. I mean, a squirrel will beat some of the fastest human beings. But when you add time and heat, because we can sweat, and you add our brain to the whole package, and you have somebody following something, like in tracking an animal, well, suddenly humans like rise way to the top. And there's these people, many people in, uh, in the past did it. And even to this day, people in South Africa, the San people, still do it. It's called persistence hunting. And a friend of mine now, Dr. Lieberman, who wears our sandals, which is, I'm kind of not getting to the story correctly, but nonetheless, he uh, writes about how human beings are these, you know, are preeminent as the, a running species. We are, by virtue of being able to both, number one, read tracks, figure out what those mean, start following something, and two to five hours later, we actually could, conceivably, without even having invented a weapon, have something to eat. That was kind of a, a, kind of a, a model of evolutionary biologists are talking about for human beings now. Okay, well, anyway, I think, okay, cool. Barefoot. Mm, bare, barefoot might work. Now, growing up here in Southern California, my, the brand of clothing that I wore and the kind of culture that I was born into was surf and skate culture. I was part of, you know, if you've seen the movie Dogtown, you basically see my life unfold before you, except I was in the suburbs and they were on the, you know, well, they were in the low end beach. And that, during that period, Hang 10 was like my, you know, th my clothing had to have hang, I had to have two friggin' feet on my clothes or I wasn't going to be cool and I wasn't going to be happy. 
And uh, the surfing culture at that time, really surfers don't count anything. Skateboarders, it's all about experience. It's all about being out there and, and um, it's very basic equipment and it just takes the skill that you, you, you develop and you end up doing these incredible things and you share these incredible experiences. And um, before the urethane wheel, when we were skateboarding, most skateboarders went barefoot. It wasn't unusual. There's a great movie from 1964 called Skater Dater. I recommend you check out on YouTube. And you'll see dudes like skateboarding. They've got like, all these club uniforms on and they've, they're like kind of an upper class palace verse. Every one of them skateboarding barefoot because barefoot was best. Everybody knew that. Then the urethane wheel came and oh, holy crap, everything changed. And then Van Doren's, which was a California company and one of the early ones was in my neighborhood. We had to start wearing shoes because we were going too fast. And it wasn't cool anymore to like, you know, wipe out when your feet were getting torn up. So long story short, barefooting was part of my life as a Southern California person. It, and basic shoes were normal to me. And I never had any of the fancy running shoes that ended up becoming what everybody was wearing in the 1990s. And then up until when I started wanting to run. So I got kind of curious about these people and evolutionary biologists and others saying that human beings were these great runners, well, it was obvious that they weren't running with uh, anything fancy. And so I was wondering about that, and I ended up stumbling on a website where this guy was riding and had been running barefoot. And I was like, whoa, is this really possible? And I read everything on his website. I spent like three days studying all these links that he had and all these studies and all of this stuff, and if you were willing to put the time in back in 2003 when I was doing this, you would have come to the conclusion that it might be possible to actually learn how to run well and actually better without any shoes on than with shoes. And I was like, is this really possible? Well, it ended up becoming possible. And um, for me, I really, like the first day I started running barefoot, it was like, Oh my God, it was like I had finally like realized when you learn how to master this kind of movement pattern that's really old. I mean, human beings have been moving in this way for tremendously long periods of time, you know, way more than historical time. And if you get tuned into the way that movement pattern feels like, if you had not experienced it before, it like suddenly feels like it's like it's like if you somebody how somehow mistakenly learned how to jump rope landing on your heels, you know, it would be really kind of ridiculous if you were doing that. And particularly like with a slow cadence. But once you start like learning how to jump rope and you like land more on your forefoot and you sort of get into a rhythm and you start feeling this kind of sense of exhilaration of like energy storing and recoiling in your body, if you start tasting that and playing around with it, it ends up being something that comes very natural to, well, human beings. And I got f playing around with that. And it led to all kinds of fascinating um, uh, adventures for me, which went from like wanting to run a marathon, which I ended up being able to run a marathon, barefooted, which was really weird. And at the time, everybody was telling me that can't be done. And well, it, of course I was doing it. And uh, at the time I was just really trying to be somebody who could find a way to enjoy sort of biohacking. And in the end, that's what it really came down to. It was like being a human being is really about being able to be a self-experiment self of one and playing around with what you have and seeing how it can work out. Well, it worked out well for me. And at that time, I started thinking, well, human beings obviously wore footwear. And what, what was so wrong about footwear as it existed at the time that when I was starting to run? And it came, came down to the idea that most footwear was assuming that human beings are like born broken. Like somehow the foot is in and of itself some kind of uh, problematical feature on the human being and that if you could basically chop that off at birth and put some kind of rubber stump there, you'd be better off. But if you can't do that, then at least you could sort of like tether it and you know support its arch and squeeze its toes in and give it some. Well, it turns out the more many of those kind of you know sort of junk science and mass marketing solutions ended up being kind of commonsensical to everybody, so that barefooting seemed extraordinarily subversive. Now I don't know if many of you have paid attention to it, but there's been a radical sea shift in the way that people look at and approach running. And um, it's like less has become more. 
and pl being part of that process has been really, really interesting to be able to have done. And one of those things has been my own personal investigations in what has been the natural selection of footwear in human societies over time. And as I did that, I found that simple sandals were being still being worn and been used for long periods of time by people all through all over the world. And at in modern times, there were three groups of people that were still using either barefoot or simple sandals to do what we would consider extraordinary things on their own two feet. One were the San people that I mentioned before. The other were these people called the Mount Marathon monks of Hiezon, these Japanese monks that run approximately 50 kilometers a day for 100 days in a row wearing a three-ounce rice straw sandal. And the third group were these guys called Tarumara, or the Raramuri, as they call themselves, who are these incredible long-distance runners who live in Chihuahua, Mexico. Well, that was pretty close, Chihuahua, Mexico, so I started Googling, and I found that there was a guy who had gone down there and started living with these people and had been running with them, and he had created a race and was trying to get people to come down and be part of this 50-mile race to come and run with these Indians. And I was thinking, whoa, that sounds pretty good. I think I'd like to give that a try. And I was very interested in checking out their sandals and like playing around with this ancient technology. And that's it. It sort of comes down to some of these solutions, these very basic mobility solutions, have been solved very well and used for long periods of time. And it turns out this sandal that these people were wearing was something that I was really itching to give a try. I'd tried some of those sandals that those Mount Marathon monks were wearing. They were like rice straw sandals, like I said, wearing three ounces. The problem is they make about 100 pair a year, and they make them themselves out of rice straw. Well, you know, I'm not going to be... 100 pair a year weaving rice straw it doesn't sound like it's going to be the most economical way to, uh, you know, proceed. Whereas the Tato Amato were using car tires and wrapping them on with leather. I thought that was probably a better, better gig. Well, I went down there and I did learn how to wear those sandals. And I was totally blown away at how uh, both simple they were and yet effective. And so when I ran into these brothers running that day, I had been spending about a year trying to figure out how to go down to Mexico to start up a company that would be re creating these sandals for you know people like us so that we could you know m most people aren't going to go out and cut a tire and and uh, make a pair of sandals well these brothers had done that <laughs> when I showed up that day the his brother was wearing a pair of sandals that he had actually made out of you know that's how that's what the kind of guys these are they had actually made their sandals out of tires you know big heavy pieces of rubber well I knew what, I knew I had some interesting people when I saw that so we, I was at the time in my garage making these sandals, and I was like trying to figure out how, I wasn't even telling anybody it was making anymore. The, the book Born to Run hadn't even come out yet, or had it? Oh, yeah, that's right, of course. And uh, people were, that after, before the book had come out, I was like selling them, and it was kind of cool, maybe 10 pair a week, 20 pair a week, whatever. After that book came out, it was like there was a lot of people trying to order them, and I was like no longer interested in trying to like keep up with the demand. And I couldn't imagine how anybody would want to like help me make sandals. I don't know why, but I was just like thinking that that was not possible. Anyway, the beautiful thing about this in the end is that organically we all sort of like, it's like my company was a one-man show, and then it slowly started growing, and it, it turns out that all of these kind of connections were just, it just happened like through relationships. In a weird way, it was just like people that were like within my space. It turns out many of the people ended up who end up working for the company, Luna Sandals, are people I met for the first time in Volunteer Park. And that really was blowing my mind. Anyway, so here I am now. It's been, uh, 2006 was when the book Born to Run, the story the book Born to Run is talking about happened. And now we have this sandal company that we're selling sandals all over the world. And people are running in them and doing their lives in them and whatever. And I got very intrigued again uh, uh, earlier this year or late last year about trying to imagine, I'd always been imagining growing up in the skateboard world and uh, five years ago, six years ago, I set the world record for distance covered on a skateboard in 24 hours. I was just always very, very much intrigued about finding some kind of solution, some kind of machine that was going to allow us to, you know, ride like a, like 
upright and have fun doing it and do it safely. And it turns out I found some kind of machine like that. So here's, here's running. Here's the basic concept of running. Running is you stand up tall, your head balanced on your shoulders, your core is slightly engaged, and you slightly lean at the, lean at the ankles, and you actually start to collapse your gravity. Actually, some writers call it that. There's, a, there's some people who write about running, and you, as a human being, you, by in this position, start to lean, and at some point, you're going to fall. And then what you do is you begin to turn your feet over in a certain pattern. And that pattern is sort of like, um, if you look at it, when, um, the impact uh, charts of running, it's almost like a smooth wheel. When you're running really well, it's almost like this really smooth, energetic wheel you're creating. And when you ride that wheel well, it really feels good. And actually, before a talk I did in, before, uh, at the New York Marathon a couple years ago, Dr. Lieberman from Harvard University said, hey, you need to Google this word endocannabinoid. Has anybody heard the word endocannabinoid? Yeah, there's a few of you. It's really trippy. So he says, my, my, uh, one, my, one of my colleagues is studying on the runner's high. And everybody's heard of the runner's high, right? Everybody assumes it's like an endo or a, uh, uh, um, endorphin experience. And he said, my colleague's thinking, no, this is not the case. It turns out that uh, the endorphin molecule to get to the place where this euphoria is happening is a little bit too big. It doesn't seem like, and he's got another theory about what it might be. Well, the theory turns out to be now science fact. And what it is, is when you move well, when, you, when you're moving smoothly, and I, I, this kind of creation of this energetic wheel when you're running really well is kind of the smoothness that I'm talking about. You can get it through dance, too, and some other smooth and human-scale movements. Not too fast, so that it starts getting adrenaline-driven. But it turns out, unbelievably, the euphoria you're experiencing is an endogenously created cannabinoid experience. In other words, if you were to take a nice big puff of ganja right now, you'd have a cannabinoid experience. In this case, it would be an exo exogenous cannabinoid experience. But the reason you would even be able to have that is because human beings, along with some other long-distance running animals, as opposed to animals that don't run long distance, are actually rewarded uniquely for moving well over a long period of time. And that unique reward is a feeling of oneness, connectedness, of being exhilarated, of being happy. That is endocannabinoids at work. Did you know that? Well, that's what I'm here to tell you. Skateboarding, I believe, is an endocannabinoid experience. Surfing, I believe, is an endocannabinoid experience. A lot of these exhilaration sports are endocannabinoid experiences. I've always thought, you know, one thing that's always depressed me is the fucking commute people do in cities. I divorced myself from that shit, man. Badass, terrible shit. I mean, seriously. And, uh, you know, the bicycle's awesome, but, you know, talking about, I, uh, there's some things about it that I don't like, and it's, uh, it's not very comfortable, it's not very safe sometimes. So I've been always dreaming, I've been always imagining, how in the hell could we come up with a way that would be, your commute would be fucking exhilarating. You'd get to work, like, feeling high. You'd be ready, you'd be, like, totally, like, stoked. And furthermore, and this is where it gets trippy to me, you know, bicycles are awesome, no doubt about it. Um, they're the most efficient human-powered vehicle that's ever been created. This is a fact. It's, it's more efficient than walking or running, for sure. The problem is, and this is what really blows my mind, do you know, uh, you know, Michael Pollan pointed this out recently, the average American diet, for every one gra kilogram or one gram of caloric energy, there are 10 grams of friggin' fossil fuels involved in the creation of that one gram of caloric energy for the average American diet, right? That's trippy. We're fucking petroleum eaters. That means that, you know, even when you're riding your bike, you're burning some petroleum. Well, anyway, don't get depressed. You can ride your bike, okay? <laughs> But it turns out I found something better. I found something better. And it turns out sometimes you find what you're looking for. And I want to encourage you to do two things. There's this dude I really like called Howard Thurman. He was uh, Martin Luther King's uh, mentor. Anybody heard of Howard Thurman? Yeah, cool. Well, Howard Thurman has this one little phrase that I like. Um, he, it goes like this. He says, don't ask what the world needs. Instead, ask, what makes you come alive? 
because what the world needs are people who have come alive, right? You know, and I'm like, whoa, dude, I like that, man, because I, I like being alive, right? <laughs> and I like people being alive because I think that when you're alive, problems are like opportunities. I mean, you know, that's very cliche, but it's true. And if you start getting inspired and start feeling like you want to do something and you start looking for it, and these days, man, we have the tools like no other time to start looking for things. Finding our community, finding the things that intrigue us, finding the things that are going to solve the problem. We have it more than ever. I mean, it's like a dream of mine to live like we're living right now. I, I mean, seriously. So I've been having this dream all my life of sort of like how I'm riding the high wheel bicycle, but wouldn't it be friggin' awesome and I would do this stand. For the last two years, there would be these pictures of me doing like this tarasana kind of stand after races and stuff. And what I would be doing, I'd be standing like this with my hands to my side, kind of putting my weight into my ankles and sort of leaning slightly forward. And I was imagining in my mind that I was willing myself through space, sort of like I would do with my high wheel bicycle. So when I would be riding that bicycle, I'd get into the state where certainly end cannabinoids and possibly exocannabinoids were involved <laughs> where I would be like totally like flying I would be flying in complete control and it was like tripping me out but so I was like going man I want to see I want to live to be able to do this like this and I was really thinking this okay last year how am I doing on time five minutes perfect so last year I, um, you know, bec becoming Barefoot Ted, all people all over the world know who I am now, and that's really good for our company so that we can make sandals and tell stories, and that's what our company is really about. It's a long story, and it's connected to all kinds of stories and humans and everything, sort of like this one. But I, I ended up in Turkey, of all places, and um, I fell in love there. Well, that's a good thing, and I, that's a really beautiful human thing, and other chemicals are involved there. Oxytocin's a good one. Um, so anyway... I end up, my, my, this woman that I've fallen in love with um, lives in Istanbul, so we're doing a race down in the, Carib or in the Mediterranean, and then we get back to Istanbul, and she encourages me to go out to these islands called the Prince's Islands off the coast of Istanbul. So you're on these islands that don't allow cars, looking over at a city that has 15 million people and has been around for 8,000 years. And I'm on that island, and um, I see this dude go by running, in a way I've never seen anybody so smooth in my life running. Now, can you, I have this aisle open right here. I, I wanna make sure that, oh, it's probably not gonna totally work. Okay, yeah, that's gonna work. So I see this du dude go by and he's running so damn smoothly, I'm like blown away. And um, I decide that uh, I'm gonna, in, next time he comes by, I'm gonna check him out because he comes by again. And I stand up and the dude is like riding on a wheel. And he's like riding, it looks like perfect running form to my eye as a, you know, I've been a running coach and I was like, and yet he's not running, he's actually riding something. But the thing he's riding is like, sort of like something from a science fiction film. And I say, dude, what the hell? You know, I immediately get out. Other people are just kind of like ignoring him. I get out and it turns out this dude's got this invention from the state of Washington, where I'd just come from, that there were, all, and I'm like going, whoa. And it's like, this is November 2012. And I'm like, uh, you know, whoa, this is like really trippy, dude, because this is sort of like what I've been dreaming all my life. Long story short, we become friends and I get one of them. And I brought it here. And I want to demonstrate what I've been tripping out on, like so heavy and hard, because it's the first human, it's the first vehicle in the history of the world in the city of Seattle, okay? Trip out on this. City of Seattle, 92% of our energy is hydroelectric. We're lucky, okay? Less than 1% fossil fuels. This is the first vehicle in the history of the world that I know that does two things. It allows you to be a human being and move like a human being. It rewards you with endocannabinoids and trip out on this in the city of Seattle and anywhere else where they can get electricity without having to use fossil fuels. It burns less fossil fuels than the average American diet-eating bicycle rider. Want to see it? Can I, can I ride it? I mean, I w if, I, if you had a big circle here, I'd be flying it all around. It is a trippy vehicle. Ready? trippy, we, this is a trippy wheel. I'm gonna ride it right through this middle thing here. 
I've been writing this all over the city of Istanbul, all over Seattle. It's got a five kilometer range or more. It's about an hour on, hour off. It's, it's, it's powered by batteries. You carry it on an airplane, I ride it through the airport. There's 2,000 in the world right now. It's the, it's the first vehicle in the world that rewards you for perfect running form. And yet, instead of you creating the energetic wheel, it creates it for you. But you have to hold your body. It's like doing yoga all the time, or Tai Chi or something, and willing yourself through space. Can any of the people with video cameras catch this? Wild. Barefoot Ted, everyone. <laughs> so what I want, I mean, I don't work for this company. I wish I did. I'm probably one of the best riders in the world right now. That's kind of easy to do. I'm planning on setting the world record for distance in 24 hours, but it's turned out to be the most radically awesome urban scape machines I've ever ridden in my life. You, are, you feel like when people stop you, they wonder why you're so manic. And it's like stopping you and it's like stopping you coming down a fucking hardcore awesome wave, stopping, saying, hey, you know, how's it going, yo? And then like getting back in it. <laughs> And you're not crashing, you know, I'm almost 50, I'm, I'll be 50 soon, 18,250 days coming up. And I was like, I set the world record five years ago, 242 miles in 24 hours, and this dude broke, and I thought, I'm gonna get, oh, I'm gonna get back in there, and then I, you fall down when you're this age, it's not so fun anymore. This thing, I don't crash, the crash is mundane, it's like a three inch drop. So, that's what I wanted to show you, thank you, and good night. Barefoot Ted.